Now, the next block is the delay lock loop. Uh, and this one takes the input clock, uh, which has a multi multiply frequency, uh, the frequency multiplied by the PLL. And this one locks a delay line into a half period. And then by tapping the middle points in, on the delay line, it's generating multiple phases of, of the input clock. Uh, so by using four stages in the delay line and, 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 and driving the true and complementary values, values of the each output, you're getting a total of, of eight phases spanning the whole 360 degrees. So again, uh, you need a model for a, a delay line, phase detector, charge pump, and a lock detector, and, and, and with a requirement that we want the bandwidth to scale with the input frequency. Okay. Um, so it turns out, uh, if, if you follow this analysis, to scale the loop bandwidth proportionally to the input frequency, we want all the parameters in DLL to be constant. That's interesting. Um, it has to do with the fact that uh, you are, um, well, in, 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 the, in the, the bandwidth expression, it contains this parameter TP, which stands for clock period. So it's inversely proportional to clock period, which means it's proportional to clock frequency. So it's already uh, proportional to the clock frequency when all the other parameters are constant. So we'll just do it that way, okay? So just like in the PLL, the phase only detector used in this uh, DLL is composed of a uh, digital gates. But as I said, uh, this is a uh, very timing sensitive circuits uh, that you don't want to model this in a, in a pure Verilog, which will suffer from the time uh, quantization effects. So we, we use these X model logic gate primitives to preserve the accuracy. And the loop filter for DLL is again a charge pump, which has a similar structure, uh, just that it's using only capacitor uh, without the series resistance. And um, well, DLL typically suffer from a lot of problem, uh, like a, a called false lock problems, depending on when, when, where your initial state is, it may converge to a, to a wrong point, or sometimes it may not get to the, get to any long point. It could be stuck at the end of the ranges and so on. So there are various ways to mitigate that. Uh, one that we use is the simplest, which is just resetting the delay line at the shortest delay uh, uh, condition. The VCDL, the voltage control delay line, is modeled as a uh, chain of four delay buffer, where each delay buffer is modeled using a delay to clock primitive, which takes the delay value and delay the input clock to the output clock. So this is another uh, volt, uh, variable domain translator primitives. And that delay is determined by the input control voltage. For this example, we're doing a linear, using a linear function. And this, uh, limit primitives is to make sure that the delay doesn't go below zero because it's just not uh, realistic. Uh, the DLL also has a lock detector in a similar uh, fashion, uh, which monitors the delay from input to output, see if it matches to the half a period uh, for a certain duration of time. Now, here's a set of simulation results uh, using a test bench built for that DLL underscore top. Uh, for this one, I can just show you uh, without running the simulation. So here are the locking transient of the DLL at different frequencies. So one is plotting the transient of the control voltage. And, and the second one is plotting the transient of the resulting delay of the VCDL. And last one is a lock signal. And again, uh, all the, at all those frequencies, the DLL is successfully reaching its locking point. And the speed at which they reach the lock point is different because the bandwidth is scaling. And uh, this is a plot of the eight output phases. Uh, and you can see that they uniformly span 360 degrees when the PLL is in lock. And uh, this is a similar 
uh, AC, uh, a similar uh, uh, test bench measuring the AC transfer function. This time, this is measuring the transfer function between the input clock period to the VCDL delay. Uh, again, we're doing this using the probe AC primitive. Okay. Uh, and as you look at the result, uh, this is a low pass uh, filter characteristics and the, the bandwidth is scaling proportional with the input frequency, which is what we want. Okay, now the next stage is called the phase interpolator phase. Uh, this is taking those eight multi-phase clocks uh, that, that are generated by the DLL, and somehow you select two of them and mix them together to produce a digitally adjustable clock phase. So again, you have eight phases, and you take two adjacent clock phases, and then you interpolate between the two to produce the middle phase, if you like. And you can adjust the interpolation weight uh, so that you can generate multiple phases in between. So bottom line is that uh, depending on what clock phase you choose from, from out of eight, and depending on the interpolation weight you use uh, when you mix these two clocks, you can generate, uh, 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 you know, uh, basically a clock phase whose value is digitally adjustable, spanning the whole 360 degree. Okay. This is a really cool search. Um, so in our example, we assume our uh, control code for adjusting the uh, phase has six bits, so that's a 64 steps, uh, and when, the, when that comes in, it, this here, here the encoder block will translate that into a proper input, driving the MUX, driving the phase interpolator, so you get the uh, 64 steps spanning the entire 360 degrees. There are more details in the uh, tutorials because we're covering a lot of lot of things today. So here's more details in the uh, the phase interpolator model. Uh, the key block is these MUXs choosing two phases out of the eight, and then inter and this inter bar X bit primitive, which, do which does the mixing, okay? Um, and the interpolation weight can be controlled uh, in an analog fashion, but since we, we want a digitally adjustable phase, uh, we put another D to A converter, uh, which is another X model primitive uh, that takes the digital code and convert that into an analog weight. One requirement for this interpolator stage is that uh, to, well, this is a subtle, to interpolate two input clock phases, this interpolator stage should have an inherent delay. In other words, I'd have to wait until you see two, the, you see the edges of the two, two input clocks. And only then you can say, oh, the middle point is right here, right? Because you cannot predict the future. So, and that delay has to scale with the separation between the two input clocks, which is going to scale with the input clock frequency. So obviously you cannot have one fixed setting uh, for the frequencies ranging, ranging like at a, a one, to, a one to eight uh, ratio. So we need an, another adaptation loop. So if you wanna build this in a real circuit, uh, the typical way is to tap the control voltage uh, from the DLL, because that one is going to scale with the frequency. And here again, uh, uh, for, for, for the simplicity sake, uh, we assume we can measure the clock period of the input, input clock, and then we will adjust the delay uh, for this interpolation stage. Honestly, if you want to build this in the real circuits, I think this will be one of the most challenging blocks. Uh, the, the Phase interpolator, oh, sorry, the, the uh, phase interpolator stage uh, has a set of MUXs that choose two phases out of eight. Uh, we added a little functionality that can do clock eight. Why? Um, this becomes more apparent later that when you do training, there's some period where you do a sideband communication and, and that's slow, that's like 800 megahertz. And during those period, your main band is toggling clock at 32 gigahertz, which is extremely high. 
Okay. Um, so main man is not doing anything uh, during that time. He's just waiting for the sideband to finish his communication. So it may make sense to turn off the clock uh, during that period to save power. Uh, to enable that, we can have an enable signal. Uh, when it's zero, it will gate the clock. And, and further down the chain, you will not get any, well, the, the, the circuit further down will not dissipate any clock power, okay? But when you do that, uh, you need to have some, uh, take some caution that when you turn off the clock, you cannot just turn off while the clock is still hot because you'll be altering the uh, pulse width of the clock. So when you make, you wanna make sure that when you disable clock, you, you do that while the output clock is at the low state, okay? So to do that, you use some retirement logic here. But at the same time, when you want to enable the clock back on, uh, you want to do it immediately. You cannot wait for the output clock to trigger because there's no output clock. You have disabled it, right? So uh, the uh, re-enabling uh, should not depend on the output clock uh, edge. So there's some, some uh, thought that we put into uh, implementing this logic. Uh, here's a quick simulation results. Uh, we're just uh, sweeping the control code from zero to 64, okay, 63 uh, to be exact, and then and repeating that process, either in the incrementing direction or decrementing direction. And because our phase interpolate spans a whole 660 degrees, when you look at the phase, it looks like the output phase keeps increasing or decreasing without bounds. This is why the phase interpolator are so cool. And uh, we ran the same simulation at different frequency. For example, the other extreme of two gigahertz, you see the output is exactly the same, which is supposed to be. Uh, it means that our phase interpolated, phase interpolated stages are capable of operating at wide frequency starting from two to 60 gigahertz. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the rest of the clock path, uh, which, which get, uh, the, the setting that goes into the different phase interpolator stages that generate the clock for the data, clock for the valid, and clock for the clock. And I will describe some special requirements uh, here, what we call synchronizing clock buffer. Uh, here's a model uh, for that clock control path. So we take the clock, through the DCC and DLL, phase interpolator will mix them to generate the adjustable clock. But one of the clock uh, will have fixed phase because you only have to adjust two to get to adjust timing uh, among them, right? So one of them is fixed at 63, the other will have variable input uh, for the adjustable phase. Now, we have a set of blocks called synchronizing clock buffer. And let me describe why we need that. So basically, uh, when this PI code that, that you know, the variable via PI code varies from zero to 63, we like the clock phase uh, to increase in a monotonic fashion. Why is that important? Um, because we have a set of three clocks that may have different clock phases. Uh, and when you enable a clock, oh, when, oh I, have to, I have to clarify this. In UCIE, clocks are not continuous. They can stop and go uh, because the data transmission are done in a units of frame, okay? So they are supposed to stop when the frame is done and restart when you start a new frame. This is different from clock gating, by the way. Um, and so when you start a new clock, you are starting these three clocks, one for the data, the other for uh, uh, the second for the valid and last for the clock simultaneously. And they all have arbitrary phases. So you have no guarantee that which one will go first, which one will toggle first, you know. Uh, and sometimes, let's say you change from PI uh, from zero to 63, it could be that the PI, the, the, the PI corresponding to 35 has the earliest edge. And as you increase, uh, the clock phases increases. And then at some point you have to change to zero. And then the maximum phase is at 34. This could happen. 
And the problem is this number 35, 34, where the boundary is, can change depending on some parameters that you don't really have control over in the real circuits. So that the clock buffer that I mentioned earlier is really making sure that PI code with zero will have the earliest phase always. And the PI code equal to 63 will have the latest phase always. How do you do that? You make sure that when the clock is on, okay, when the clock is on, the clock for the clock will start first. This guy will always start first. Uh, and you make sure that uh, by enabling the clock uh, only when the clock for the clock has been enabled. Okay. Uh, to do that, I guess I have to explain how our clock, uh, the clock gating buffer uh, looks like. So clock gating buffer is just a AND gate that it propagates the clock only when the enable signal is high. I guess you'll the real circuit, you will have additional clock buffers for the buffering. Um, and we have again, another, uh, uh, again, uh, another retiming flip-flop to make sure that you, you, you switch the enable signal at the correct time. You know, for example, you don't want to change the, uh, the clock's high pulse width. Okay. So this one will naturally produce a synchronized enable signal. Uh, that is proper for uh, doing the clock gating. And, and the trick is you take that synchronized enable for the clock, for the clock. Okay, that's odd. And, and then you draw, use that as an enable signal for the other clock buffers, uh, the, the one for the data and the valid. Okay, this way uh, you achieve the effect that I mentioned before. Okay, so this is tricky. Uh, but this is something that uh, took us a lot of effort to figure out how to do it properly. Um, another thing is, uh, based on the spec, uh, we have additional D skewer buffers. Uh, they can, you know, uh, do additional clock phase adjustment. But on honestly, I think we have enough capability of adjusting the phase using the phase interpolator. Uh, so we're actually not using it. Um, but here's how you can describe. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before that, here's a simple result of the test bench. They can ensure that PI code corresponding to zero has the earliest phase and the 63 has the latest phase. And it starts only when the clock for the clock uh, toggles first. Okay, so this is the model for the D-score. Again, we're using a delay to clock primitive here uh, to adjust the delay between the input and output clock. And that delay is controlled digitally uh, using a D2A or DAC primitive. So this takes the digital code, produces the analog value for the delay, and that delay will determine the uh, input to output delay of this uh, buffer. Very simple. Okay, this is a simple test bench measuring the DC transfer function between the input code and the delay to the uh, buffer. Uh, 